Okay, here we are in Giraffe. Um, we always recommend that you use Google Chrome if possible. Um, we are built largely on Google infrastructure and we are optimized for um, Google and Chromium viewing. If not possible, no stress, um, you can use uh, Internet Explorer or Edge, whatever it's called now. Um, we do find Safari often has a few issues rendering stuff on the map, but um, if you really have a browser that you're very wedded to, or you know, for business security reasons, you can't use Chrome, get in touch and we can talk about the best solution. When you log into Giraffe and create an account, you'll be asked to create a workspace or you will join your company's workspace. And your workspace is noted up the top here. So I'm in my Giraffe team workspace at the moment. Uh, which is where we do a lot of our demo content, but I'm part of lots of different workspaces for lots of different users and groups. Um, so you can toggle between workspaces if that is needed for your use case, um, but we find mostly that uh, most users only have one single workspace that they're working on. It's really important to make sure you're in the correct workspace when you start working because all of your projects live in that workspace. So it's a little bit like Google Drive or Google Teams. And if you're not in the correct workspace, you will not find the corresponding project that you're looking for. So the best thing to always check as soon as you um, log in is your workspace. Now, there's a couple of ways that we can start a new project. Um, at the moment, we're in a scratch pad state. So you'll notice in the URL here that we have this word scratch pad. And this is essentially like a blank word document. So at this point in time, we have a map. Um, it's going to kick you to sort of the place that your IP address, um, you know, thinks that your location is. So if you're using a VPN, you may get taken to a different part of the world depending on, um, you know, your settings. I'm based in Sydney, my IP address knows that, so here we are. Now, there's a couple of different ways you can start a new project, as I just mentioned. Um, when most people log in, they will come to a screen that says welcome with their name, and they can also choose their workspace here and toggle between them. Um, this menu of existing projects is exactly the same as that one that I was looking at in the top bar. So this welcome screen really is just a, a faster way to um, move between different projects or, or different templates. So that's what these boxes are here. So we have a concept of templates in Giraffe and what that does is start a project sort of at 50% already done. So it means you can have a lot of your layers already formatted, a lot of your apps added um, and a whole bunch of those sorts of pieces of work that you might do immediately upon starting a new project. We're going to start with a blank template today because I want you all to see how we might build up all of those elements to then create something like a template later on for our team. Um, so you can click blank, but I've already done that here. So when you start a blank project, it is unsaved and in this scratch pad state. And what we do is give you a number of layers by default over on the left hand side. So every user, no matter what workspace you're in, if you start with a blank project, that is not a template, this is what you'll get over on the left. Now, the map should show those as you sort of zoom in and out depending on the content. So if I turn on the satellite layer here by pulling that to the left, we should see that satellite layer turn on. Um, I'm in 2D view at the moment, so I'm seeing everything from above, including these 3D buildings. I can turn them off and on. Um, and that is because we're in 2D mode on the map currently. So down the bottom in the drawing tray towards the left, there's a few sort of map related um, commands here. And one of them is 3D. And if I toggle 3D, it means suddenly I'm in a 3D view of the map, which is awesome if you have 3D content. Sometimes you may want to work really specifically in 2D mode, which will always have north up the page as a normal map would. But 3D view allows you to really, you know, customize, change your data layers um, and, and really interpret a city. Um, a few really quick words on navigating the map, just in case any of you don't use maps very often. Um, in 2D view, you can scroll in and out with your mouse very easily. Um, if you left click and drag, it will let you pan around the map. Um, and if you go back to 3D mode, 
You can also click T on your keyboard, which is a shortcut or a hotkey for 3D mode to toggle between the two. In 3D mode, you can also left click and drag to move around. But if you right click and, and pan, you can actually um, pan around the map at multiple angles. Zoom also works. So I'd encourage you to just spend two or three you know, minutes playing with that if, that if it's not something that you often play with. Um, the other command in this bar uh, toolbar down the bottom is the little search map. If you click this, you can drop in a, um, an address. Oh, Clarence Street in the city will go with. Um, so this is a geolocation tool. Now we are built on Mapbox, which is what this base is. And this um, address search is also linked to the Mapbox um, the API with the with the, the geo search here. So some addresses may or may not be really specific depending on the location and the accuracy of Mapbox's data sets. Um, unfortunately, that's the only option we have available at the moment. We are looking to potentially connect to um, Google's API or some other more sort of open source or more accurate data sets. But for now, this is really helpful at you know getting you to an address or a city. Just please be um, conscious that it won't necessarily prioritize anything in your location. So you can see here it's suggesting a whole bunch of American and English places as well as one in New South Wales. So just keep refining your search until you, you know, see something most relevant. Okay, so that is how we navigate the map. Um, let's head back to just talking about layers on the map for a minute. So we now know we can see 2D and 3D layers. Um, and these uh, sliders on the left-hand side control the opacity of the layers. So here I can make my building sort of, you know, brighter or more opaque or more transparent rather. I can turn off my map layers, et cetera. Now portfolio, if you're a brand new starter is not something that you will have, but what portfolio does is shows you all of your projects um, that you have in that workspace. So I've got projects all across the world here. And so we, we talk about this as a portfolio of projects. These big outlines or these sort of um, boxes with the, the black outline and the white fill are the project boundaries, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, but just so you know what those shapes are. Now, I don't really care about the portfolio here. So I actually can click on these three dots and remove it because it's not necessary. Um, we do have, as I say, our satellite and our 3D buildings, so we can play with those opacities as we like, but you're absolutely not limited to these data sets. So what we're gonna do is add some new ones now. If I click on this data layer button over on the left, it's gonna open up a modal here that connects to nearly tens of thousands of layers in the giraffe library. Um, we have some public layers and then many of our users have their own private workspace layers. So the layer that you're, the, sorry, the tab that you're taken to by default is all layers. And these are all the public data layers that are in Giraffe. Many of them are open source or open government data layers. So I'm based here in Sydney, New South Wales, and a lot of the layers that are being suggested to me here are some of our planning controls, but nearly every single one of them is authored by and maintained by the New South Wales government. Um, the layer name is obviously here and then the details essentially is the metadata that comes with that information so this layer here land zoning if i click this little drop down i see you know the location of it a description um, should tell me how often it's updated sort of information like that and i can really simply check the tick box for um, this layer and when i close this tab it will add it over on the left but before we leave, there's a few other things that I want to add here, which includes the cadaster, which is our property boundaries. Um, I think I also want to overlay a heritage layer here. So just very simply, um, you know, search keywords that meet your criteria. And um, it should be really straightforward to find layers that, you know, meet your criteria. We do have a number of other different ways to find data. 
So my layers is very specific to each user and it's going to look different for everyone. But these are layers that I personally have added to Giraffe um, in this workspace. Sometimes they are, um, they can be made public and sometimes they can say private just to me, but this is where I can come and find those layers at any time. Workspace layers is another really useful way of sharing information across your team or your workspace. So obviously I'm in my giraffe team workspace. So that means that anyone in the giraffe team can come here and look at these specific layers that have been uploaded. Um, and essentially they're confidential in the sense that only people who are invited to the workspace can see them. So if you are working across a large or small team, this is a really um, easy way to publish information and share it with your team rather than making it public to everyone in giraffe. Um, we're not going to talk through portfolio lens today because it's a little bit more advanced um, and I'm not going to upload any data, but I am just going to really quickly point out the types of data that you can load into Giraffe. We have tried to make it um, really open and accessible in terms of the different types of file formats that you can load. We, um, our team has worked as architects, urban planners, engineers, and having really you know open and accessible file formats is really important because giraffe can't do everything and you need to be able to import or export data and take it somewhere else to do the appropriate you know work or analysis so the types of layers that we do let you load are vector layer, vector files so that's looking at formats such as a geojson a shape file a dwg which is like a cad drawing file um, a kml and a few other types of vector layers we also let you upload images. So if you have a master plan, for example, or a citywide strategic plan, you can drop that JPEG or PNG, whatever format you like, on the map. You can place it, scale it, rotate it, all of that sort of good stuff, and then use it as a really fantastic, um, you know, base layer that you can reference and even trace over if you're trying to recreate a 2D plan and make it 3D, which is something that we do often. Um, the next one is some, they're actually pretty um, custom to Esri, but they're very widely used across a lot of government um, across the world. And those are some of the Esri 3D and 2D file types. So we can um, import map servers, feature servers, as well as scene servers. So all of those have to be hosted on external infrastructure, which is, again, very common to government. But if the private sector are doing it, they'll usually export something like a, um, an SLPK, a scene layer package that is not hosted already and we cannot like load it and host it for you. So it needs to be transformed into something like a scene server and um, a URL needs to be generated. But once you have that, it's very, very easy to visualize that data in Giraffe. We do accept WMSs. Um, we have found them a little problematic in the past our opinion is that they're a slightly dated type of data. Um, so if you do have any trouble with uploading a WMS, please get in touch and we can help you. And we can also ingest Mapbox styled layer if that's appropriate. Um, I don't think too many of our users use this option. They usually bring in the vector file themselves and style it in Giraffe. So if you were to load any of those layers, you can then add them to your workspace or your own personal library, share them with users or keep them confidential as you like. Um, so we can you know, very deeply connect with an organization's um, GIS team. We can leverage all the data. We don't need to host it ourselves. You can still host it, but just stream it to Giraffe for your users to use. Okay, so um, I've added a couple of layers here. I'm now just gonna close this box and we should see them pop in on the left over here, which they do. And you'll see they all turn on immediately and are sort of, you know, tiling up on the map as we go. As I mentioned, these are all data sets that are owned and maintained by the New South Wales government here. So we're getting the most up-to-date data that the government publishes at all times, which is fantastic. Every time I log in, the data may have updated, but I will see that update on the map. So what I'm gonna do is, first of all, I wanna group these layers. So it's very easy to um, manage this panel on the left-hand side. 
If I click and drag these on top of each other, I can give these a name and say these are all my planning controls or something appropriate to your use case. And I'll grab Heritage and drop that in here too. These are now in a group and I can control them all at once, which is really nice. Um, I might turn off these two layers for a second and just look at the cadaster. So these are our property boundaries. I'm just going to click and drag this group above and I'll then we have some sort of nice hierarchy here. I'm going to turn 3D buildings off for now and turn my satellite maybe off altogether. So now we have some property boundaries. We can sort of see a little bit more about the city, how it's um, shaping up. And obviously you would curate whatever sort of overlay of layers that you needed to tell your story or do your site analysis, for example. Now, something um, I think that is really fantastic about Giraffe and that makes it a little bit more flexible for you is that not only can you bring in different types of data, but depending on the type of data that you have imported or connected to, you can actually do analysis on it. So I'm gonna show you a feature that we call Lens now. So over on the left here, you see um, against or next to every layer at the start of it, there's a little icon. So this first one is a drawing layer, which we're gonna talk about next, has a little pencil on it. But every other layer that is more of a contextual data layer has either an image or this sort of rectangle with the four corners. Now, these two symbols mean that they are different types of data. This um, one with the image, like the satellite and these three planning layers are um, raster layers. And that means that they're essentially an image that has been you know, scaled and um, plotted at the right location but it's made up of, you know, rasterized um, pieces of information. And so we can't really do a lot of analysis on that because it only understands so much information about itself. However, vector layers, which is what the rectangle indicates. So vector layers um, know a lot more, I guess, about themselves. It sounds a little bit silly to describe it that way, but these buildings all have, you know, four corners or more than that, and they understand. So if I pick um, this building here, this building already knows a lot about itself, which is really nice. So it means that we can do analysis on it. So what I'm gonna do with this 3D building layer is actually, I'll just come back to Sydney CBD because it's kind of the most striking place to do this analysis. I'll just close the right-hand side for now because we don't really need, we can, get that real estate back. Um, so what we can do with this 3D buildings layer, because it's vector layer, we can do some analysis on it. So if I click the three dots next to it here um, and I open lens controls, it's gonna pop up this kind of subtle box up the top here. Now, there's a few things that I can do now that I'm here. The first one is that I can add a filter. And if I click add filter, it gives me some options. Now. Maybe before we pick through these, what I'm going to do is show you under settings, or it actually pops up on its own down the bottom, even though it's under this little red dot, is this concept of showing the table. Now, depending on how familiar you are with different formats of data, you know most of the time, especially something like a shapefile or a GeoJSON, there's a nice text explanation of what data is actually included in that package. So here in this table, we can see um, there is a name inferred for every building. Um, and then there's some other columns of information that describe it. So we can see here a really great height column. And so this is describing the height of every building. And if I keep looking along, we can also see a type, which is really interesting. So there's kind of like even an area of square meters, which I assume is the building footprint. So there's already three pieces of data here that we could use to do some analysis. So I'm just gonna hide the table again. And if we go back to our filter here, we can see those same columns here. So I'm gonna go by type for now. And what it's doing then is basically giving me some pretty generic commands that I can filter on. So you could say if a type is building or commercial, um, you know, any number of these uses that you want to filter for. 
um, you can begin to do that. So as I'm doing that, you'll notice that a lot of buildings have turned off that don't meet these conditions. Again, I could change the command. So is not this, which would filter out more sites than less or whatever command you like. But once you've filtered them and you, you can add a secondary filter if you want. So you could say, show me every building that is these uses and that let's go with height. And that is greater than let's say 20 meters. And so already, even though there was a lot of buildings down here that met these criteria, they're all less than 20 meters in height, which is awesome. Now that we've filtered and sort of found the information that we want to display, we can actually style it as well. So if we click on style here, there's a few things to take in here. So I'm just going to walk through them quickly. This type of geometry is 3D. So that's pretty obvious. If you did have um, circles, so they could be something like bus stops or, you know, school locations, whatever it is, if they're just points on the map, it would likely recognize that they were points and have circles shown. So you can see these circles now, but we know that these are 3D buildings, so we can keep it there. Similarly, fill is something like, you know, census data or other types of big polygons on the map that represent, um, you know, statistics or, or otherwise. Now, at the moment, all of these are colored white, which we don't want. So we wanna remove this property and we can then color by one of those values as well. If we click this button, we can actually use a fixed color, which we don't want to do. So I'm going to go by type. And what it does immediately then is just picks a default color, but it will color those uses then that we can see, which is really fun. So we've taken these like, you know, seven types and it's now picked a color for each of them. We can change those colors if we want to, if I want to make retail, you know, some sort of nice pink color, we can do that. So this is deeply customizable, very easy. Um, a few other things that we can do, we don't want to play with the opacity or the height. So here it, to extrude that 3D content, it's taking the height and then putting the base height, which is zero for all of them. And it's scaling them at the scale it's supposed to be. But if you did ever want to exaggerate your data, you can do that by scaling it. What we can add now is some labels if we want as well. So here we need to select our label details and make them a type. We can just keep them white. We don't need to color them if we don't want to, but we could color by type as well. And we would just want to change that retail color um, to be that you know same pink, whatever I made it before. We could come up here and just copy this number if we wanted to make it exact. And then we have um, you know some buildings with labels they are dynamic labels so um, they will try and group together to put more real estate on the map if it allows for it um, we can turn them off at any time if it's a bit too much and if you have 2d data this outline is really fantastic so this is putting a an outline on the base um, geometry of those buildings in 3D view, it's actually just more confusing, but that outline can be really helpful depending on the data. So we have now styled some data. This is a global data set, this open this 3D buildings, open street map stuff. So obviously there's no buildings through here that meet this criteria. I'm sure if we went to somewhere like um, maybe Chatswood, I think is here there are some buildings again that meet that criteria. So you can keep that um, those settings turned on if, if that's appropriate for your project and the analysis you're doing. If it's not, and you've sort of answered your question, you can really simply hit clear all, unclear it, and the buildings or the data layer will go back to how they originally were. So that's the lens feature. It's really handy if you need to tell a story about a data set or do some pretty basic analysis. We are hoping to build out some more features in the future that let you um, sort of uh, do some other GIS functions there. So you might be able to join one data set to that existing one that you can filter on, um, you know, create radius like or distances from certain features, things like that. But that's in the works at the moment. Okay, so we've got some layers on the left. We know how to use the lens feature if needed. Let's start drawing and telling a story about our site. Now, 
I, when I created that little lot earlier, I accidentally made a um, project boundary. So to save a project in Giraffe, you need to draw a boundary. Um, I'm going to click this button down in the drawing tray here and click edit project boundary and it will take me to that location. Now, let's say I am actually just going to clear this boundary, which should delete it. And what we what we do then, is, this is sort of where you would be if you hadn't accidentally drawn something on the map. So we've got a prompt in the right hand corner that says draw boundary to save project. If I click that, um, let's go here and we're gonna do a master plan here that includes the park and um, some of these lots adjacent. We'll do some new apartments overlooking the park. So your boundary can be not that important or really important depending on the type of analysis that you're doing with your project. If your FSR is really um, important for the work that you're doing, um, then you want to draw your boundary as accurately as possible. If it's not that important, you can make it as sort of lumpy or you know inaccurate as you like. You can always edit it later. So don't stress if it's not really accurate. I'm gonna go with this boundary for now. So when I'm ready, I can click done. And then what I need to do is save the project. So hopefully you remember at the start, we are currently in a scratch pad state. We're in an unsaved project and we've done some work on the left here to bring in layers. We may have styled them to tell a story, but if I was to leave giraffe, this will not save. So we need to save this project once we've drawn a boundary. It's going to give it a name um, that meets, that is from the centre of the boundary that you have drawn, but you can change it at any point in time. We have some workspace properties that are not really relevant to this demo, but if you um, think about that portfolio layer that I showed you earlier, um, workspace layers can help you save properties or information against each project that you can use to analyze your property portfolio or your project portfolio. So if that's of interest, please get in touch and we can do a deep dive on that, but it's sort of a bit beyond 101 today. So I'm going to save this project and what it will do now is ask me if I want to share it with anyone. So Ian and I have worked together before. If I have Ian's email, I can drop it in here and then choose what type of access he has to the project. If I want him just to view it as sort of, you know, like a manager or a client relationship viewer, we'll let him only come in and zoom around the map. He won't be able to change content. If he's an editor, he can edit the content. And if he's an admin, he can edit the content and share it with someone else. You don't ever have to share a project with someone if you don't want to. So if that's not relevant and you don't have a team or the whole workspace to share it with, you just go to your project. Now, what we do there is we basically kick you out and bring you back because we're saving that project to the database. So two things have just changed. The first one is that there is now a name for this project here. So instead of unsaved project, I'm now in the 101 demo project. And you'll notice that Scratchpad is gone and I've got a project ID here, which is really nice. So now we've got a proper project and we can start putting some content in. So what I'm gonna do is show you how to start drawing that content. Now, when you draw in Giraffe, you need to be a little bit conscious of the, the layer that you're drawing onto. So if any of you have any experience with other drafting tools or any of the Adobe suite or something like that, you'll know that when you draw, that content needs to live on a layer. So we give you a default layer by default <laughs> and at the moment it's empty. So over here, it's got the pencil, it says default and empty. And you'll notice down here in the drawing tray that this is the default layer as well. Now, what we're gonna do is actually not draw onto that one, but create a new drawing layer. So you can click this plus button here or this plus button up the top here. They do the same thing. And it's gonna ask you to give it a name. And so I'm gonna call this one option one. <laughs> and we're gonna create that. And you'll see now that there's a second layer over here and there's two layers to choose from in here. Now, the one that is bold and has the green pencil is the active layer. And the active layer is also shown down here. So you can check it in two ways if you like. You can change your default layer at any time, but for now we wanna draw onto option one. Now, 
I always recommend that you draw in 2D because when you start drawing in 3D, you can sort of get some strange exaggerated shapes that are not quite as accurate as, they think, as you think they are. So let's draw. And there's a few ways we can do this, but most of them are contained down here in this sort of third of the drawing tray. Um, so if you click on the little building, you can start by drawing different types of buildings. We're not going to draw from this, we're going to start from scratch. And so if you come all the way to the third or to the last, um, the last button, the three dots, here we have some general drawing types. So we're going to start with a rectangle. And if I click rectangle, um, it will give me these little sort of this big black dot on my cursor. And what I'm going to do is zoom into the location that I want to draw. And I'm going to start by drawing one edge of the building. So when I draw that, it's going to ask me to define the secondary um, side of the building. And you can see that this is a nice, perfect rectangle now. So when I draw that, I now have this shape. I can see the edge, the length, sorry, the length of the um, building, the depth of the building, and then the total square meters. But this isn't actually a building yet. This is what we call a polygon um, or a section in giraffe. This is an undefined shape. So you can leave it like that if you want. Um, it's not that useful at the moment in 2D or 3D, except that we know the area of it. But what we can do now is give it some attributes. So if I click on my shape, when you do that, you'll notice that uh, we're no longer in the layers panel, but we're in properties. And when you're in properties, it's going to prompt you with some information. So the first one is that it, it needs a usage. So we'll talk a little bit more about how you define these usages in a few minutes, but what we do is just basically pick something. So I'm going to go with generic residential here and you'll notice immediately that it pops up and it kind of understands that it's a building. Now, it already had the layer and we, so we, we decided this was on option one when we drew, but it's got some other information here. The first one is levels. And we have a default that residential buildings are 10, 10 um, stories by default, but you can control that. So you can pull um, the slider and, and play with that at any time. Um, let's go with four um, stories for now. Um, we also have this concept of stack order, which when you have a single building doesn't really mean much, but when you have a second building, it means something. So we're going to go back to 2D view, so T on your keyboard for the shortcut. I'm actually going to um, increase the size of this. So let's talk for a second about how you edit a shape. So just because you start with something doesn't mean it has to stay that way. You can start by clicking and dragging any existing point that you want and make it whatever shape you like. If you hit Control Z, it will undo those moves and take you back to whatever point you like, just like it does in Word and lots of other programs. Um, another thing we can do is actually pull aside. So if you grab any of the red um, arrows on any, on any side of your shape and you pull, you can control that. If you wanted to actually maybe offset something or snap to some sort of setback, that bigger number that you can see in the middle here that is dynamically changing, while you are clicking and dragging, if you type, it will type into that text box and snap 10 meters. If I'm pulling in the opposite direction and want to snap 10 meters that way, it will work too. It's just based on the direction that you are dragging. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to make this an extra large footprint like this. Um, and so now we have maybe what I would say is the um, base level of our building. Now, we might actually just have a bigger sort of setback from the curb and the street. So let's do maybe something like this. And um, what you can do also on any shape that you've drawn is add new points. So as well as dragging existing ones, you can create new ones at any midpoint. So where you can see that sort of transparent red AR circle, you can create a new dot point, uh, sorry, a new anchor point. And you can then sort of pull them and make some sort of wavy design if, if that's of interest as well. Okay, so now we've got what I'm going to call our podium um, building. And what we can do now is 
come back here and either pick rectangle or polygon, but rather than start from scratch this time, let's come back here and click residential. Now, when you use any of these building typologies, it's gonna give you that rectangular um, tool again. And so now we have a secondary building that's sitting on top of our podium. Now, if I come back to either of these shapes, you'll notice that both of them have a property called stack order. And they both have a stack order of one, but if I change the top one to zero, you'll notice them jump around. So stack order essentially dictates how they order themselves on top of each other. Um, you set this stack at any time. The first time you stack something, giraffe will try and put the large shape at the bottom and the smaller footprint, um, no matter of height on the top level. It doesn't always get it exactly right, but again, you can really, really easily control this stack order um, yourself. And you can stack as many elements as you want. So if I um, want to put one more uh, feature on top of this, what we're gonna do is draw again this time. Using our main menu, we have polygon, but we also have a shortcut for it, P. So I'm gonna hit P on my keyboard it's given me that black um, dot on my cursor. And I'm gonna introduce one more command here, which is a snap command. And again, if a lot of you do any drawing, this is a pretty common feature. If you hold S on your keyboard, it's gonna try and snap to different points. And you can see that red outline is showing you where it's gonna snap. So I wanna basically duplicate this, um, this tower that I have. And then what I've done, is create um, a new shape here. Now, this is actually sitting, if I go ahead and move like this, you can see it's sitting there underneath. Now, when you have multiple things stacked on top of each other, regardless of whether they have a usage assigned to them, um, it's gonna ask you to select. So I don't want residential ground floor or residential tower number two. I want that no usage option that I drew. So the first thing I'm gonna do is give it a usage and I'm going to say um, residential and immediately it jumps on top and it's 10 stories. I'm gonna go two stories, Ooh, two instead of 112. And what I'm gonna do now is grab that again, not that one, this one. I'm gonna make sure that it's stack order is number three and I'm just gonna offset it. I'm just gonna type my five, so it's five meters from every side. And then suddenly I have maybe I'm, some I'm using this. I've never used this before. <laughs> oh, sorry, let me, um, oh no. Uh, let me just open up my participants. Um, so is that you, Maria or Sarah? Sorry, I, I've just touched that something on the screen. I don't know how to put it back. Oh, okay. I'm and I'm completely lost now. I know. Do you want, I, do you want to call me back? <laughs> <laughs> um, are you? There's a few different voices going on, so I'm not exactly sure what's being asked. Um, Maria. Did you say you're on Yeah, I was trying to ask you, I, I touched something on the screen and I've messed it all up and I don't know how to put the screen back the way it was. Um, what does your screen look like, roughly? Like what's missing? Can you still see this panel on the left-hand side? Uh, yeah, but I, I just- That's I, good. But I, mean, I know I've touched something and, I, and I'm not supposed to and I'm just trying to put myself on mute again and I, I just don't know how. <laughs> Oh, okay, I see. Um, I can mute you if you like. <laughs> but um, uh, just in terms of if, if just if someone does, you know, accidentally move away from the map, or, you know, is not sure where their content went accidentally, there's a few things that I would just double check. The first one okay. is up next to the name of your project, there's this little um, bullseye, and this will take you always back to your project boundary. Now, the content may not be there, but at least you get back to where you're supposed to be. Um, the next thing to check then would be what's happening with your layers. So you may have accidentally turned a layer off. If you did have multiple things selected accidentally or purposefully and you hit delete, they will disappear, obviously. Now, Control-Z 
should hopefully bring them back if you've deleted them. And you can do multiple control Zs or undos. Um, but without taking a look at your screen, I can't troubleshoot exactly, but I'm happy to jump on a call later today with you, Maria, if you want to do um, some follow-up stuff. That's okay. I'll keep rolling just because we've only got 15 left sure. and I want to do a few other things, but we'll, we can chat later and I, I can mute you if you like. <laughs> okay, thank you. No worries. Okay, so now I've got a building. It could be too big, too small for this context. I'm not sure, but I'm happy with it for now. Um, one thing that I want to mention here is that this is great. We've got um, this building and it's all residential. What I might want to do is actually take this uh, podium and maybe make the bottom floor retail or commercial or something like that. There's a few ways I can do it. At the moment, this is four stories of residential, but I'm going to select this podium and I'm going to click Control C. I've copied this to my keyboard. So this is again, a really normal command and then Control V. Now, when you paste something, always make sure that it's on the correct layer. It will paste onto the active one. And then there's two, two things going on here. So I'm going to select the bottom one. And what I'm going to do is first of all, make this one story and change it from residential to retail. Now that's really easy to do. Just because you've drawn something does not mean it can't be edited at any point in time. These things are meant to be super flexible. Um, so you can, you can do that sort of stuff easily. I'll then grab that residential one and I just wanna drop that maybe even down to two. And I might make this first level of the podium a little bit uh, shorter, I think, to this is all sort of single um, level, you know, single dwellings around here. So that sort of 15 story building could have been a bit intense. Now, a few things just to note, obviously we're casting a shadow here on this option, which is really nice. I just wanna note that the minute you change the transparency of your building, which could look graphically really lovely, we will stop casting shadows. So if you're ever uncertain about where your shadow's gone, check that you're at 100%, not at 99 or 98, because you won't see a shadow. Um, and now what I'm gonna do is just really rapidly draw a few things, just so we can fill out option one and you can see some content on the map, because then we're gonna talk about how these numbers are being generated from this content. So, um, that I can continue drawing the way I was. So I'm hitting P for polygons here. And again, this gives me some sort of, you know, flexibility when I draw um, this shape and I can edit it and move it. So let's have maybe some green space connecting through to the park. And I've got this sort of funny one. I can rotate and type an angle if I know the exact um, degree of rotation that I need. Um, I'm going to make this a commercial ground floor probably maybe let's go community actually um, community is probably a little bit more applicable here and we will make it two stories or two levels um, which you can see there what I might do is then copy and paste that layer again and this one I'll make residential and we'll make it maybe four levels now what I can do here is a really nice setback command um, so if I do six meters, it's going to not snap at six meters. That's okay. Let's um, put that back to zero. Um, what I'm going to do is add a new property here. And this is, you know, getting a little bit more advanced, but I'm just trying to show you the kind of functionality that you can rely on if you want to. Sorry, not a property. I'm going to go down here. Once I've selected this um, uh, section or this geometry, I can click space bar. And it's giving me a, a whole bunch of advanced sort of drawing tools here. And one of them is offset. This is a uniform offset, but you'll notice that this little menu opens up at the bottom. And in here, I'm going to type three meters and hit enter. And that has then expanded that footprint by three meters. So I'm just going to undo that, control Z, and do that one more time. Offset. And I'm going to go minus three in here and hit enter. And now it's offset that three meters uh, uniformly from every side of that building. And the last thing I'll do on this option is maybe, I don't know, a warehouse. This is obviously a bit of a silly sort of urban um, form and pattern, but we can get, see some variety in how you can manipulate this as well. 
Um, let's just get a more of a step back on here as well. Okay, the last thing I'll draw is a little park. So in this landscape icon down here, we've got lots of different options. One of them is simple landscape, which is kind of the most multi-purpose um, landscape type that we have. And so this might be kind of a thoroughfare for community to get through to the park as well. Um, if we come back here quickly, we can drop in individual trees. So these let you just drop points on the map, um, which is really nice. And so now we have, you know, it's not very beautiful, but we do have, um, you know, some sort of little urban form here. Now, I want to explain quickly how we're calculating these numbers, because hopefully you all notice that as I'm drawing, these numbers are quite dynamically changing and moving. And so if I really dramatically increase floor space, that warehouse typology is growing pretty, pretty quickly as well. So these usages that you have picked here are all basically documented typologies, urban usages, whatever you'd like to call them. So over up in the top here, so we've got a number of apps or modules. And the first one is kind of the little interface where we control all the assumptions that apply to a usage. So we'll pick residential because it's kind of the biggest um, type of floor space in this option. Now you can pick any different um, typology that you want from this table and adjust it. But what this is doing is just kind of like laying out all the assumptions that are you know, used for that typology. So the first one is the efficiency rate, which if you're based in Australia, you know, FSR, FAR, GFA, all that sort of stuff is pretty well understood. Um, for, for you, SolQ, and anyone else who might be from overseas, that's kind of understanding our gross building area or our floor space ratio, or just kind of understanding what that built form is. So we've got an efficiency rate here that we can change if we want to. Same with the cell efficiency to calculate our net sellable area. We have a floor to floor height. I'm gonna do something quite dramatic just to demonstrate how this works. 3.2 is fairly common, you know, but I'll go four to four meters for the floor to floor height. So in a minute, when I click save, these buildings here are gonna jump up much higher. And you might have noticed already that that industrial um, floor to floor even the community and the retail is a higher floor to floor height than that residential usage. And that is because in reality, that's how these things often play out. So I'm just going to change it here just for demonstration purposes. Um, and then this next, we don't have any visitor parking bays, but you could add a number here and that would make a fixed number of visitor parking bays per building that you put in. But we're going to talk dwellings. So there's a few things to understand here. First of all, this slider dictates how many, uh, like the percentage of the floor space that these types of apartments um, make up. So we might want no three bedrooms. So I'm going to set that to zero. So now I've got kind of a mix between studio, one bed and two bed. If I didn't want studio, I can set that to zero as well. So this percentage then is good. It's going to drive our count, but what actually is made up of that count? So that's where these little um, interfaces here help us. So we don't really need to worry about the studio. So let's talk one and two bed. So here, what we're saying is that a one bedroom apartment is 60 square meters. If you're in the Northern hemisphere, this will change to feet by default. You can edit this so we can make it 65 square meters in size. We have a price of dollars per um, square meter per dwelling, a number of car spaces that we assume happen, and people per dwelling as well. So if you're in a more of a planning sphere, this is a really nice way to help you understand maybe future population as well. Once you're happy with those, um, you know, numbers, and they can be customized at any time, you sort of can keep moving. This stuff here you can see is sort of more graphic and then some cost analysis. So here is the color that we're seeing on the map. I can make these, you know, like a more sort of orangey color and change the line color and whatnot. Um, these costs become sort of a little bit more advanced giraffe. So if you're really interested in understanding the sort of feasibility of your design, get in touch and we can do a deeper dive. But once I'm happy with all these settings, I'm going to click save. And once I do that, you'll notice that these uh, yellowy buildings get much higher and the color changes. <clears throat> 
we just call. Cool. So this is a global assumption for any residential building that I have drawn. Um, the question that I usually get around this point is, am I limited just to these usages? And obviously, if you have like dwelling a job related ones like commercial, industrial, retail, there is a job um, a job assumption as well that helps you calculate jobs per square of square meters per job. Um, so total number of um, employment population. But what you might want to do is have more granular types of usages or things that are way more relevant to your urban context. And so what you want to do to create new ones is pick the one that is closest to the usage that you're thinking about. So I'm going to do residential. I'm going to clone it and call this one medium density, or it might be shop top or you know anything that is appropriate to describe your use case. I'm going to click OK. And now I have a new one. And what's happened is because I picked the closest usage, it's inherited, inherited, sorry, all of the assumptions that went with it. And I might change those for this medium. So I'm going to put this back to 80, back to maybe 3.2. And let's change this mix to something slightly different. And it will go a little bit different on the color and save. Now, because I don't have any medium density residential buildings attributed yet in this project, it's not going to do anything. But what I can do now is actually select and here I'm holding shift. So it's going to pick multiple, um, it's going to pick all three of these buildings. And over here on the left, I can change that usage at any time. And my medium density residential one is in here. So now I've got a little bit more sort of fidelity or granularity. Um, I have a different type of residential product to maybe this premium one over here or something like that. Um, so what happens then is we use the assumptions that sit with every one of these um, usages and we start doing some calculations. We have a lot of documentation about exactly how these things are calculated, which I'm happy to share if people are interested. But you can see here that we're getting, you know, total floor space either by gross building area or gross floor area. Um, we have a total FSR, which obviously includes the park. So it's a very low FSR. Um, and we can see the number of parking spaces that are um, supposed to be provided for that number of users. We can see the breakdown of apartment types and then the number of residents that come with that. Um, just talking about parking really quickly, we do have a number of parking typologies. So let's do a multi-deck park. What I'm gonna do is actually grab this floor plate and copy and paste it. I'll grab the bottom one. And instead of a warehouse, we will make this parking, which is car park. And we can then choose which type it is. And I'm gonna call it multi-deck. And you can see then that we've got uh, one level of parking and I could make it more if I needed. So it's, it's subtle, but they are supposed to be see-through just to differentiate them from a building. So we can see the ground and then the parking inherent within it. Um, and that now says that we're providing 164 parks, but when we're not hitting that target. I'll just move that warehouse out of the way so we can see what's happening. With this car park type, we can um, look at the properties to see here car park. So for every 2.85 um, square meters, we're providing a park. So if you need to increase that to maximize ramps or maybe servicing types of stuff, you can change that. So there's a whole bunch of settings that go with car parks too. Now, um, what I wanna show you really quickly is that this is all my option one. So if I turn this off, all my numbers go away. And so I'm controlling these options like this. What I'm gonna do very, very quickly with the last 60 seconds that we have is make an option two and show you a pretty advanced feature of Giraffe just to make you think a little bit harder about how we can use Giraffe. So we have this feature called Flow Features here. I'm gonna use the apartment algorithm and draw a, something that would never be approved in Sydney, but a pretty long apartment building that um, runs the length of this lot. It's not a good urban outcome, but you can sort of get a sense of what this tool can do. We can make it a bit um, silly and fun 
um, but this algorithm responds really nicely to um, you know my prompts as I draw there's some it's not that complicated once you get into it but there's some pretty interesting stuff happening here using our flow builder for anyone that has ever used rhino or grasshopper this will look really familiar but what we're doing is creating a geometry and assigning a whole bunch of assumptions to it um, uh, a few other things that extend um, through these are we can add a row of trees so we can line our park with some nice trees here we can control uh, sorry not that button i'm going to click here on the generated features we can control how far apart they are um, how far from the start of the button they come and and so on and so forth so this flow builder gives us lots of interesting options we can even put in a big sports stadium here uh, i don't know, can't remember off the top of my head how big an olympic one is but it certainly wouldn't fit on this site but here we've got you know a nice local park um, sports stadium and what we might do is put a community building on this side it could be a grandstand or something um, community friendly and so now we've got option two drawn up and I can sort of turn that off and control it and those numbers come again on the side and something that I just the point of showing you these two options was just to explain that if you have option one and two on at the same time even though they have competing interests we are showing all numbers at once. So if you are using giraffe for calculations, you just want to very explicitly manage your layers to get the right numbers. If I put this even on 3%, you can't really see it, but the numbers are counted. So if you're ever confused about the sort of yield that you're seeing, just really make sure that you're managing your design options well. So um, that is, we're one minute over time, so please um, drop off if you need to, but to summarize, Hopefully you understand how to um, navigate the map, how to draw a boundary and save a project, how to add data layers, potentially group them um, on top of each other and control them. You understand how to draw some of the content on the map using the drawing commands. And you know a little bit about the types of calculations that we can do off the bat. There's a whole number of other things that we can do like solar analysis. We have a lot of different apps and modules that let you manage um, your data in lots of different ways. But as a sort of 101 class, this was a pretty basic run through. So please get in touch um, with myself or Holly Conrad Smith, who should have sent the original invite if you want to have a follow up. And um, we would be happy to talk you through any aspects of giraffe or sort of dive deep on the kinds of work that you and your team do. So thank you so much. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. You too. Bye now.